and this is uh, Paul Barish coming to you from Hospital Management Asia 2015. Today I'll be delivering a podcast for the Patient Safety Certificate Program. The podcast is entitled Patient Safety, a Human Factors Approach. This slide shows a picture of a busy scene in a cardiac surgical operating theater. As you can see, multiple people working around a space of about five square feet with multiple devices, multiple instruments, a prime example of the complexity in surgical healthcare, in fact, the complexity of any hospital around the world. You can imagine just viewing this picture, the opportunities for slips and failures, for mistakes and errors, in fact, for self-injuring as well as injuring the patient the way the devices stand together, the way they interop or do not interop. These are the types of questions that human factors as a field deal with. To say accidents are due to human failing is like saying falls are due to gravity. It is true, but it does not help us to prevent them. This is Trevor Kletz's wonderful quote from his book in the 1960s. Human factors engineering is about designing the workplace and the equipment to accommodate for limitations of human performance. It's not a black or secret art. It's a pragmatic and robust process that influences everything you do. Chairs that you sit on, beds that you sleep in, computers that you work with, in fact, everything you work around. Healthcare, in fact, has been slow to adopt this designing element. These are the human factors related discipline, ergonomics, human factors engineering, engineering psychology, human machine interaction, cognitive engineering, and of course, industrial and organizational psychology. This graphic helps to elucidate the complex domains that are part of human factors. You can see here the cognitive sciences, artificial intelligence, acoustics, ergonomics, engineering psychology, management, industrial design, and so much more. All these shape training, communications, workload displays, and how we feel about ourselves, our work, and how we interact with the world. At the center of human factors is a user-centered design approach. What this means is that systems need to be designed to fit people and not vice versa. That means that if humans are prone to errors or to certain misrepresentations or certain ways in which they sit, stand, or talk, the technologies need to be adapted accordingly. By doing so, we tend to be able to reduce the training time, to minimize human error, to improve performance, and of course, to improve productivity. At the heart of this is, in fact, a focus on speed, satisfaction, safety, accuracy, and self-evidency. Here's an example of two different medications that look very much alike, but in fact, one is a fairly innocuous drug, eye drops for the eye, and the other is enough to cause serious harm and destruction of the eye. Both are 1%. They look alike. Same height, same colors, but in fact, because of poor labeling, you can see the confusion that's unavoidable. The five different approaches to problem solving are equipment design, so changing the physical equipment. Number two, the task design, changing how the task is accomplished and what sequence you man. The third thing is the environmental design, changing features of the work environment, such as the sound, the lighting, the temperature. The fourth is the training. How do we change the behavior of the worker by providing skills and teaching procedures? And finally, the selection. Can we recognize individual differences in their abilities to accomplish work more effectively, more safely, and more joyfully? We've spent a lot of years studying human factors in congenital heart surgery. We've done this at Boston Children's in Boston, at the University of Miami Children's Hospital, and at the University of Northwestern Children's Hospital in Chicago. This work, of course, is based on years prior to that in which the Bristol Infirmary Inquiry and the Manitoba Inquiry and others similar demonstrated that human factor failings in pediatric cardiac surgery led to a heightened death rate as much as 20 to 30 percent higher than otherwise due to a misunderstanding and a lack of appreciation of how human factors plays into supporting these children's outcomes. Outcomes. Here's a slide that shows the Bristol Inquiry from 1986 when it was first began to 1994 when it became public. As you can see throughout those years, several dozen children every year died unnecessarily because of a lack of appreciation of what was going on and a lack of a human factors approach. Next slide, you'll see prior to 1995, the mortality rate at Bristol was at least two and a half times higher than the average rates in the other pediatric cardiac surgical centers in England. 
as opposed to that, from 1999 onward, you can see that the outcomes in Bristol after leadership changed, after human factors elements were introduced, the pediatric cardiac surgical outcomes were better on average than the combined mortality of all other surgical centers in the UK. Here's another way of looking at it. Again, Bristol, you can see what happens when the changes happen, external inspections, change of leadership, change of training. And now, and continuously so, the mortality at Bristol is one of the lowest in Europe, not just in the UK. So when we study pediatric cardiac surgery and the role of human factors, we're looking at a highly complex, low error tolerant environment, highly dependent upon a sophisticated organizational structure, coordinated efforts of team members, and high levels of cognitive and technical performance. These high-risk populations, such as neonates in particular, exhibit a very fragile physiology. Just to put it into perspective, 30 years ago, nearly 100% of these children would die within 10 to 30 days. Today, close to 90% of them are able to survive. Human factors, institution, and surgeon-specific volumes, complexity, and systems failures have been linked to variable outcomes in pediatric cardiac surgery. There are eight common operations that are done in pediatric cardiac surgery, ventricular septal defect, tetralogy of fellow, atrial ventricular canal, atrial switch, ASOs, Fontans, Truncus, and Norwoods. Next slide. As you can see in the next two slides, the variation in outcomes across the U.S. in this case on these eight different procedures varies up to six fold between the best and the worst centers, a, a dramatic difference considering the challenges involved. The next slide shows a Norwood procedure outcomes. These are funnel plots, and you can see how the various centers inside these two external lines are acceptable, but any dot outside those lines in which mortality is so much higher. In fact, the overall mortality rate is close to 20%. That is to say, one in five children will die after these procedures. So what are the research questions that we're asking? Number one, how do some teams learn and recover so well? Number two, how do some adverse conditions that are mediated by human-factored controlled factors such as team and task processes lead to negative outcomes? And number three, can we reduce the negative outcomes, that is to say morbidity and mortality, at the individual level and the team level by meeting the conditions? The domains of the project that we've used include human factors engineering, organizational psychology, applied organizational psychology and sociology, industrial psychology, and of course, clinicians, surgeons, anesthesiologists, and other providers such as nurses and echocardiographers. In the next slide is a model that we've used based off Jim Reason's model in which system threats are mediated through human factor controlled elements such as organization, environment, task, and patient. They lead to opportunities for technical or non-technical failures, which hopefully are mitigated through recovery mechanisms and if not, lead to adverse events. The next slide is an outline of the study. The literature review, we discovered that errors are common and often lethal in these children. Distractions and disruptions to the team limit their ability to recover. Multiple type of hazards exist to these teams, organizational, cultural, interpersonal dynamics, training, and of course, supervision of less than super trained individuals, high profile cases, and finally, learning together can be challenging. In the next slide, I'm going to talk about the system errors. So we define them as rarely having just a single cause, but are the result of multiple errors that line up to create a system failure. A human factors engineering approach is needed, and of course, improvement is needed through the microsystem. You can see in some of the references here and online more about this. Here's an example from Ken Ketchapol, a lead scientist now at Cedar sinai in Los Angeles. When he was in the UK, he looked at how people communicate in different cases. These are two different hospitals. Hospital A, in which there's detailed and explicit closed-loop communication. Hospital B, in which the surgeon says, okay now. Anesthesiologist says, yep. Surgeon says, all right then and off they go without much communication or explicit involvement of the perfusionist. In the second case, Hospital B, they had a major adverse event in which they went on pump without heparin and the patient died. This is a model of the human factors assessment that we've done in the OR. You can see here the schematic drawing of the various providers, the perfusionists, the nurses, and of course the technologies involved in these cases. The red arrows demonstrate a social network analysis in which you can see when people communicate, who they tend to communicate with, the length of the arrow signifies the amount of communication, and of course how much communication is happening between the providers. 
The method in the next slide, um, two human factor trained PhD observers, handwritten notes, a scoring system based on Aristotle from one to 25, a case coding at discharge, one being death, four being a great outcome, technical and non-technical skills being assessed, and finally, a high inter-rater reliability, or a kappa of more than 0.7. What that means is that two different observers looking at the same event will have a high concordance of their observations. Next slide shows you pictures from our live camera from the operating theater. You can see one camera at the head of the patient, one camera at the head of the surgeon, one camera at the foot of the bed, and one camera above the perfusion station. Next slide shows a brief summary of some of the observational data, 102 cases from Boston Children, 42 cases from the University of Utrecht in the Netherlands. And you can see here the number of hours. We observed over 900 hours. We annotated more than 1,600 cases and the mean case complexity as well as the age of the children. I want to skip now to process mapping. Process mapping is a fundamental tool that industrial engineers use to map out the process, as you can see in the next slide. Here are the results of our mapping out of our pediatric cardiovascular surgical care. And you can see how complex a simple step like moving the child from the cardiologist to the anesthesiologist to the surgeon and then through the process can lead to opportunities for failure. We then use this process map and map out the hot zones and thus we're able to map out where are resources and time needed in order to identify how to improve the process. The next slide speaks to our cognitive task analysis. This is a tool that we've used that essentially lays out what are the key steps that the surgeon does, the anesthesiologist, the nurse, and then we align those three. This allows for the observers to map out exactly what happens and in what sequence. Next slide shows our sequence. You can see the process flow on the left of the slide from the time the anesthesiologist meets the patient all the way to the time that he arrives in the ICU and discharges the child to the responsibility of the ICU attending. You can see the name of the domain and, of course, the major event list on the right. And as you can see, major events are not equally distributed, but in fact, they happen three times more often just coming off pump. Next slide shows minor failures per operation. You can see again that the most complex procedures engender the most failures, and you can see level three to six, those are the ones that are the most problematic. Next slide shows some highlighted team failures. For example, swab causes compression of an artery, omission of key surgical steps, um, multiple uncertainty leads to task breakdown. But these are the major failures. How about the minor failures? We discovered that communication failures, absence of key team members, equipment failures, and awareness failures can equally contribute to adverse outcomes. The next slide shows again some examples that we looked at in our studies, ranging from the oxygen tank wasn't full when it was brought to the OR theater, so people had to do mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation in the elevator, to missing out on key pieces of equipment leading to delays, process failures, and ultimately to patient harm. In the next slide, you can see the detailed scoring from the study, the outcomes on the left, all the way through the average length of surgery and the overall minor events per case. And as you can see in this slide, in all cases, there's a number of minor events. And that is really our focus of human factor changes. Here you see a breakdown of major and minor events. On the top, the typical cardiovascular ventilation and bleeding. But on the bottom is where I want to focus your attention. 44% of all minor events included communication, coordination, and instrumentation problems. So these are things that we can focus on in every case and clearly relate to better outcomes. The next slide focuses on our work on identifying non-technical skills. So how do teams talk to each other, communicate with each other? We've used a variety of methods and modes in order to better help surgical team members learn about this. We've used the mini star. How well did you sleep last night? Are you well prepared? Do you have any concerns about the equipment or the people? We look at a safety culture assessment, such as the workload and communication. We detail the process checklist. And finally, we use Rona Flynn's Notex, or the non-technical skills checklist. In the next slide, you can see work that we've done on situational awareness, this core element and how team members understand how other team members function without necessarily communicating. This is a central element of high reliability systems. When each team member knows what other team members are about to do and therefore, as in a music ensemble or in a theater trope, they know exactly how to work together. Next slide shows a detailed breakdown of the four domains of the node text, uh, the Rona Flynn's domain. You can see the first is leadership and management, the next is teamwork and cooperation, the next slide shows problem solving and then last is situational awareness. As you can see, each of these elements is measurable and reliably fed back to the individual providers as a way to help them improve their performance. 
So in summary, as we look at the future of healthcare safety, we talk about key elements that need to be addressed. We call these wicked challenges. Despite a lot of work gone on, we've still not been able to reduce these challenges enough. Number one, moving from a culture of blame to a culture of safety. And I encourage you to listen to the podcast on a safe culture, infection prevention, which is still a huge problem, transitions of care and communication, operating room and equipment design. Again, these are discussed in depth in other podcasts in this series. Richard Prelep has done some elegant work looking at human factors that contribute to mishaps, for example, normalization of deviance, poor communication, production pressures, inadequate provider experience, lack of skilled assistance, and finally, faulty or absent policies and procedures. What to remember? So human behavior can be predicted with reasonable accuracy at all ages. Number two, correctly integrating human factors thinking into your accident investigation will reap great rewards. Look at the contemporary causation factors for that matter. Separating error, mistake, and violation represents a highly valuable first step. That means that people, and most people in healthcare, are trying to do the best they can. So when they make an error or mistake, we don't hold them accountable for that because they did it in good faith. However, when people violate and harm people because they work around the system, we need to hold them accountable. This is the just culture. How should you apply human factors thinking in your work environment? Number one, avoid reliance on memory. Number two, making things visible as much as possible, either oral, visual, through your eyes, through your senses, through any other element possible, reviewing and simplifying process at every step of the way, standardizing common processes and procedures, routinely using checklists, and decreasing the reliance on vigilance as the backbone for your environment. As a final thought, the most powerful influence on human behavior is the outcome. Therefore, managing human failure requires a high degree of corporate and management honesty. What that means in practice is thus. What behavior is really rewarded? Are we willing to look at the organizational factors, especially when we see rule breaking by workers? Are we willing to make the investments that are likely to prevent the reoccurrence of these problems? And finally, are we willing to strive for objectivity and pragmatism that's based on true psychological safety of the employees in which they feel safe and comfortable to speak up so that if they see a problem of their own doing or of others, they don't get punished and censured, but they're actually rewarded because of a gift that they bring to the organization. That's the end of podcast on human factors approach. Um, you will note online a series of references as well as in the podcast. I'd encourage you to go deeper. This is a complex topic and we'll be discussing it at depth in the course. Thank you. <laughs>